Greetings, humans. This is Chuck. Welcome to the third episode of the Interprofessional Podcast, where I still don't know how to do a podcast interview, but I am trying my best. So in this episode, Honey LaFleur and I talk about professionalism in a corporate context, communication, and being bold, and being an artist in a corporate landscape. Uh, we talk about all kinds of things, and we uh, say the F word a lot, and uh, we have a great time. So just a reminder, if you're listening to this and you need some digital marketing strategy or coaching or done for you marketing services, you can always go to www.identitypending.com to learn more about the services that I provided my agency for bold business owners who want to do something interesting and not blend into the sea of homogeny that is online marketing currently. Anyway, let's get into the episode. Welcome to the third episode of the Anti-Professional Podcast. I'm here with Honey LaFleur, and I will be doing my customary uh, poetic introduction, uh, which goes like this. Honey LaFleur, a dash of grandeur, mysteriously vulnerable, a subtle saboteur, inspiring us to move, inspiring us to breathe, letting us let go, a moment's reprieve, intuitive movement, the body's voice, active engagement, living life with a choice, never linear, never easy, passing up the people pleasing, righteous hot tears among friends thank or uh, welcome to this space thank you for your grace i'm glad to see your face so let's break the internet <laughs> oh my God. that's like so good and i'm just like ready to cry that's so sweet uh, you would be the second you would be the second person to cry on this podcast out of three episodes so <laughs> we, there's still time yes yeah there's plenty of time uh, okay, and then my customary first question for you is, who are you and what do you stand for? Oh, God, who am I? That's such a question, especially coming <laughs> from you. I feel I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> what's my answer to that for Chuck? Uh, okay, so I, Honey LaFleur, am uh, a queer, like a queer artist. I feel like first and foremost, um, I am also a queer professional in whatever definition that means for anybody. Um, and yeah, I like to, I definitely am an empath. And I think a lot of the work that I do, be it artistically or even um, in, in my day job, or I'm in the corporate world, um, I really try to center humanness mm -hmm. um, and, and like a little bit of empathy in, in everything. Um, yeah, I'm just like queering the shit out of all of this, like one image at a time. Um, mm -hmm. and one little dash of like an Easter egg of like socialism, mm -hmm. anti-capitalism. <laughs> just leave the corporate <laughs> landscape, just sprinkling it about. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like getting a little more blatant at this point, but like I keep getting away with it. So like. They must like it. I hear they keep inviting you back. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's perfect. I, I love that. And and so then that's, you know, I heard you say that you're a queer professional. So I'm curious what your experience has been with uh, the concept of professionalism and your orientation around it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I love this idea of anti-professionalism. I think it's, I think it's incredible. And I also think that, like, in that is what professionalism is and can be, right? Mm -hmm. Um because I, you know, I think that there is a way to show up in this world and like be inspiring and impressive, but it doesn't have to be the way that like people at the top have said that it has to be forever, <laughs> right? Like it's less about what you uh, look like and more about what you do and say. Um, and like, it's been a long journey to get here. Like I also really want to be honest and upfront and that like I have failed over and over again in trying to be what we typically think of as professional. <laughs> um, and just, you know, like check those emotions at the door. And let me tell you something that does not work. <laughs> mm. um, and I have even uh, in my roles in positions of like some form of power have like, chosen the ableist route or like chosen the like the like unempathetic thing to say like it is so much easier <laughs> well i don't even think it's easier but it it feels i think in some of those moments it can feel um 
powerful, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, or like there's just something in it that it like easy is not the right word, but it, maybe it's simple mm-hmm. um, to to choose the uh, the sort of capitalist, ableist, like patriarchal like way to mm-hmm. do and say things and like. You know, I like I what I wouldn't give to maybe go back and like shift those moments a little bit. But also, I think at the end of the day, I have learned so much from them Um, and thinking about like, wow, I really I I just said that (laughs) shit. Um, And knowing that, like, I myself have done the exact same thing that I have, like, been sort of like I had chosen to chastise. Right. Like in those moments. Um, Mm -hmm. And that blows. That sucks. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that it comes with a lot of a lot of fuck ups, a lot of um, a lot of like getting fired. Like I was fired in 2020, <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, like it is such a cliche to say that it was the best thing that ever happened to me. But like as somebody who um, you know, I had a little bit of privilege on my side and that like my partner at the time was fully employed and was like, okay, we'll figure this out. Like I had that, but like, I freaked out. I freaked the fuck out because I have never not had a job. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I have never not. Yeah. It's terrifying. Um, I, you know, had just come back from fucking medical leave. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I'd been back for like base, maybe six months. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like, um, but yeah, it, it, uh, all of that to say like burn those bridges because all of the mediocre white men before us have done it and like continue to thrive. Mm -hmm. So like, why shouldn't the rest of us? Mm -hmm. Um, and I say that in terms of like any identities and any intersection, intersectioning versions of those of like it's harder for some of us than others. And like, we can do, like, we can do it and we can all like, like, I I feel like you also have been like very inspiring in that when like you and I first met on fucking Instagram and then like Mm -hmm. actually became like in-person friends at the vessel of this, like, yeah, no, we can do this. Like, why are we not already doing this? Right. And like, there's just this little bit of community that like, um, even if, like, I feel like you were a big support, even though, like, you and I weren't really giving each other a lot of, like, direct support. Mm-hmm. It was just, like, oh, I see this person who is, like, different from me, but also kind of similar, like, doing this same thing. And, like, we're both surviving. Like, let's mm-hmm. keep doing it, right? And, like, those little moments can be huge, even if we don't realize it at the time. I, think um, I don't know if that thing- answers your question, but... I think, I think it does. Like, yeah, like it gives me a, a good lay of the land and it makes me think about like why I think us existing like publicly and loudly is important because I have no role models who look like me. So I have to basically be that role model so that the next little baby, you know, clown twink who wants to be a professional, you know, has a, has someone to look up to and says, well, if Chuck can write a book and start a podcast, then why the hell can't I? Um, you know, I always say everything's made up and see what you can get away with. Uh, because like you said, lots of other people who are less talented and less interesting have done it already. So why not, you know, like splash some paint on it? Yeah. Like there are men with actual video podcasts that are really successful and they have nothing to say. So like we, sh- we have way more interesting things to say. Well, yeah. And, and I think that's the other thing is like, I'm hoping to get perspectives that maybe just haven't really been reported yet. That's the whole point of writing this book. And I, I think mm-hmm. I mentioned when I asked you you know, if you wanted to do this, I realized my own perspective was not enough. Like I need mm. other people's perspectives on this concept because mine is, you know, it has such a specific lens and everyone else has different experiences. Um, and so then that brings me to my next question, which is what are the parts of professionalism as it stands that you think need to like die in a fire? And and like, what do you want to build after that from the ashes? Ooh. So much of what professionalism is like really needs to die. Um, You know, the, the whole idea of um, like school as an experience or like a degree or a certification as an experience, honestly, it's just classism. It's just like a barrier truthfully. And I'm about to go on my rant, uh, good old Ronald Reagan, but like he is the one that made college unaffordable. 
because mm -hmm. people of color were starting to catch on that college was an option um, and that it was slightly affordable and it was a good thing to do. Um, and so, I mean, it's like more nuanced than that, but like essentially he fucking ruined a lot. Um, and we all knew it was coming. It could, it maybe could have been anyone else, but also he was so, I want to say he was like one of the first like celebrity politicians mm. that mm -hmm. came along and he really like shifted that. Yeah. And he, um, yeah, he's just like a fucking, was just a fucking monster in his, like, I, I literally follow a TikTok that every day it has like a video that's like, it's this day and Ronald Reagan is still dead. It just like warms my heart every morning. Um, like literally hating his legacy is like a big part of my personality. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. But it, but it really comes down to this, this idea that like the eighties were such a big, and it was like when a lot of us now who are now in our thirties, right? Like I was born in 1984 and um, that was his like heyday. And that was the heyday of all of these like social structures that existed to help, to help people cope and like move forward in their lives and, and, you know, have the support systems that we all needed. And, um, they were slowly stripped away because the rich, like rich people were seeing that like money was being distributed to poor people <laughs> and people of color. And they were like, know? Ooh, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, and like HOAs, I was listening to, um, another podcast Ooh. with, yeah, with a friend of mine and, um, we, they were, it was like a, it's a gossip podcast. And so the story was about this like guy that's part of, that was like the HOA president and was just like trying to make their lives like miserable, um, of this couple that was trying to build a house within mm. the HOA. And like, I was like, I bet HOAs were introduced to like, you know, ruin everybody's lives. Like I used to work for a company that answered phones virtually. Um, and I can't even tell right. you the amount of calls that we got. Like there were specifically a couple businesses that like dealt with, HOA, like legally. Um, so whether they were supporting HOAs or not supporting HOAs, like I learned more than I ever will need to know because I will never buy a home that has to deal with mm -hmm. HOA or a condo no. association. Like they're terrible and they are there to keep people out. Right. And we, mm -hmm. like, we were fully like listening to it and we looked it up and it was fully created around the redlining like redlining mm. times, which was when black folks were being able to buy homes. Um, and like mortgage right. hoops started showing up shocking, mm -hmm. you know, barriers. Yeah. Um, so all of that, but I, um, yeah, I think that like these ideas of, of like certifications and school, um, are barriers that really need to just like burn in a full on fire. Um, mm -hmm. I think these ideas of, what we look like can also go to hell um, and burn in a fire. I think that like looking put together is very different from one person to another. And I do think that like, you know, I, I have in my life been distracted by the way that certain people will present themselves physically. Um, but it usually is like, it's more like people that think they look professional in that way. Like they're mm. trying and it doesn't fit them. You know, it's like, it's like they're putting on a costume and you can tell, um, more than anything, like, mm -hmm. you know, like I've seen dudes show up in these like nicer outfits that are then like rumpled and wrinkled and they don't look comfortable. And I'm like, you know what, man, if you normally sport like a mohawk and like leather with like, I don't know, combat boots, like I'd rather see you in that mm -hmm. <laughs> because at least like, then, you looking comfortable. Yeah. Like you're fucking comfortable. Um, yeah. And, you know, and myself, I love showing up in like this bright ass lipstick and, um, usually even more like makeup on. I just, uh, you know, it's like, I love that, but I've also shown up with no makeup on and had great sessions with people. It's all about looking and feeling comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's what can come from the ashes, like rise like a Phoenix from that is this idea of, um, in fact, my old, at this current place I'm working at, my old boss was like, I really want to put something in there about like professional presence. And I, mm. and I actually really enjoy that phrasing. I think that that is something that can come out of the ashes of professionalism as we know it, because that one is all about 
presenting yourself for what you want to be. Hmm. And you get and to make up those rules, right? Like, right. Like how I'm like, well, I get to be a digital marketing coach who is like weird and like, you know, colorful and, and artistic and whatever, because mm -hmm. that's the brand of professionalism that I'm trying to create. Uh, yeah. But if I was trying to look like everyone else, I don't know if I would get half as much work because I don't think people would remember me. No, no. And I think that you get the, like, I think about, right, like our friend, uh, Danny, who works, was like, I'm working with Chuck a little bit. And like, mm -hmm. it just like, it warms my heart because I'm like, you two are so different. And it also obviously makes mm. so much sense that Danny would gravitate towards you. And like, I think about that too, where I'm like, whenever I get my own shit back up <laughs> from the ashes that it is currently in, I'm like, <laughs> what I want is to work with someone like Chuck that is going to say like, I get why this shit doesn't work for you and hasn't mm -hmm. in the past. And here's the things that I'm going to tell you. Right. Like, and it's like, I follow you and I know what you, I have an idea of what you would say, but I'm also like, I, it doesn't stick in my brain in that way. Cause I'm currently not working on that. Right. But I know, mm -hmm. like, I know you well enough and you're memorable enough with your content for me that I'm like, yeah, that, that is who would be right for me. Like totally. Well, I don't know. That's, I, I, you might relate to this, but part of why I got so into this was, was rage. I was just so <laughs> mad because I, I took all the sales and marketing training and like paid these dudes like $5,000 to teach me how to do something that I later found for like $20, you know, uh, whatever. Um, but I was so mad because I was like, you're teaching me to manipulate people. You want me to make them insecure. You want scarcity and urgency. I was like, bro, I was like, I'm, that doesn't align with my spiritual experience or like anything. And then yeah. I kept meeting other people on the autism spectrum who were like, I don't want to manipulate people. I don't want to lie to people. So I'm just not going to sell ever because that's what they think selling has to be. And I was like, yeah. well, now I'm mad. Now I'm mad. <laughs> so I have to go destroy these brads and chads, as we call them in one of my groups. Uh, I, <laughs> it's like, I love that term. Uh, but, but yeah, it's like, there's, it makes, I feel like some popular narratives make it seem like there's only one way to be successful mm -hmm. or only one way to sell one way to market but it's like there's infinite ways to solve these problems like i've been encouraging people to do stunts like if you don't want to get on social media like go stage like a crazy performance art piece downtown or like i'm doing a direct mail campaign now it's like i feel almost like geriatric doing it but it's like you know why not like yeah it's if, fine if, if facebook ads aren't really working for me why don't i send some postcards out um it's novel and i think if you start thinking about uh, like marketing as a way to stand out with novelty and also just like have fun and get people to notice you in a way that entertains you. <laughs> I think uh, like these days people love chaos. So like, why not? Well, yeah. And I think about these, you know, this thing of like, if it, if you're not entertained by it, if like, if you're bored of it or you're not passionate about it, like, I mean, I can think about like why my, like, you know, you and I were trying to build like coaching uh, businesses at the same time when we mm -hmm. like, met on Instagram, right? Like that's how you and I started messaging. And then like mine, I was like, you know what? I'm really, I'm not feeling it. Like I don't like the way that I am being taught to like gather sales. Like I think mm -hmm. that what I have is different and exciting and really cool, but also like these methods just don't work. And even like getting some feedback from like people that I did trust that were like, I don't see like what, like, I don't totally get what I would get from you. I'm like, I hear that. Also, though, like, I don't really want to change what I do on social media about it. Like, I really liked what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Right? And, like, that to me is just, like, I'm not reaching my target audience. And I don't totally know who that is yet. And that's fine. Like, right there, like, that almost presented, like, uh, more relevant problems for me when I thought about mm. it and this idea of what, again, like what is professionalism for me in terms of mm -hmm. like being a coach who works for myself and does this thing that is really wild. Because like, as you know, what I was doing was I want, and I still want to do this. Like I want to create a business where I show up to, honestly, I want to do it for businesses that normally wouldn't hire people like me. Like I want to do it for like the Nikes, the, the ad agencies, like the, um, you know, the FinTech, like Google, like I want them to hire me so I can do like these movement sessions with T 
teams and then the organization as a whole where like they learn how to deal with their fucking anger and their emotions Mm -hmm. in real time and like just fucking connecting to their body (laughs) and that's weird like that is really Mm -hmm. weird for businesses um i actually taught a little course on that for the company that i was fired from and like part of that was that presentation. Like my boss was like, I didn't get it. And I was like, that doesn't, that shouldn't be an indicator of whether or not like it was good. It was Mm. good. You just like, and I literally said to her, I was like, it's not my fault. You're not smart enough to get it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, when I, when I hear you talk about that, it makes me think about, I, I always make this argument about like, you should do accessibility because it's the right thing to do, but also you will make more money. So yeah. it's like, if, if you do this emotional process saying you should just do it for your own well-being, but your teams will probably perform better if they yeah. are like in touch with their actual feelings about each other or like communication styles yeah. or even having confidence communicating authentically. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we don't really create spaces for people to learn those skills anywhere else. No, I mean, like I have linked in current, like I create management trainings and these are like upper level management trainings that I create for people specifically. And like, you know, I have images of like Jacob Tobias, Mm -hmm. who is like a queer, like for anyone who may not know, like they, they do a voice of a character in She-Ra, the Netflix like animated series, but they also have a book called Sissy, which is lovely. I highly recommend for every, literally everybody. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's about like, it's sort of a memoir of their like gender expression journey. And they are known for like wearing, they're very similar to Alok, like full face of makeup, Mm -hmm. usually facial hair also. Um, and like, they sort of started it by inheriting their grandmother's like costume and real, like a lot of their, her jewelry, Mm -hmm. like her brooches and like, they would wear them all over and just like, and developed their style from there. And it's like a very lovely, um, you know, loud, gaudy style. And I think about that video that's been circulating recently of a loc on Instagram of like, you know, don't just save your good clothes for like an occasion. Like every day mm. should be a day for this. Um, mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I feel about professionalism, right? It's like every day is a, is a day for you to try out the version of yourself that feels the best because that is really what's going to keep you at your job. Like I have not compromised one thing. In fact, I have been not even more of a squeaky wheel, but I have just been the voice of dissent more now than ever. And like, I love that you get to do that. I know I do too. And I, and I like, you know, and I'm certainly not, um, you know, I think I have learned there are certain emotions that I think we all need to keep in check, but we all need to remember like kindness first, right? Like, Mm -hmm. like the person I dissent with the most is the one I like the least. And I consistently have to check myself. (laughs) Mm-hmm. In like not telling her that I think she's an idiot, but mm-hmm. I do find the space to be like, here is why I find this to be an issue. And I just go through it. And when she disagrees, because she always does, I'm like, mm-hmm. fine, but here's the thing. I'm not going to do it this way because one, I have ADHD and that's not like, that's not going to work for me. So what I need you to do is this for me. And it like works. Um, and I feel like I, I over, like, even when you and I would talk, I feel like that worked for you also at the last company that you were at too, where you were like, you know, like I, yeah, until they laid off until they laid me off, (laughs) but yeah, that's true. Uh, I did just survive layoffs. So congratulations. You know, like sometimes it works. Um, (laughs) I will say my company is much bigger. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think mine. I think, I think mine was part of the like, uh, startup, like over evaluation boom where everyone's like, every startup is worth $90 million. And then they were like, oopsie daisy. Uh, looks like all this money was fake. Um, I guess you're worth nothing. It was like an actual <laughs> like, scam. Yeah. It's a kind like of, they should be wild those, like, you know, scam art, like, like, uh, like, you know, they're up there with like the WeWork shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's like the entire government. <laughs> Or like venture funding in general, I guess. Listen, I don't know. Yeah. You know, and honestly, we all learned a little bit from Lizzie Holmes. Like, here's the mm. thing. She really hurt a lot of people. However, what she did, listen, she should be in jail for frauding people that actually were like misdiagnosed and like did yes. not get the medical help they need. 
However, what she did to Banks, I don't, I don't give a fuck. Honestly, mm -hmm. go off, Queen. You were amazing. You did what every other man has done, and same thing with Anna Delphi too. Like, quite frankly, mm. I think she should be. I think she should get a national holiday for just for just for like holding a really solid con. Yeah, mm -hmm. like even the girl that she like stole credit, like that put all of her shit on that Amex credit card. Like, Amex wiped that shit clean. She sold her story to the company she worked for, to Vanity Fair. Like, she's fine. Uh -huh. Like, I'm sure she needs therapy, whatever. But, like, she's <laughs> going to get it. She is not without. So, like, I don't give a fuck. Like, let's give Anna Delphi a fucking national holiday. She needs I do think the biggest a... banks in the world. I mean, that's an impressive feat. And you have to be very smart and very... Uh... Oh, man, it's something I could never do because I can't keep a secret. But I do. I'm always impressed by people who do that. Like, I love watching those exposés. I'll watch them all day. Right. They're so like, they're so good. And I'm just like, that is why professionalism is bullshit. Uh, is because, yeah, because like, they just use professionalism to like skirt through the system. Yes. Whoa. Like, if you watch the um, Shonda mm -hmm. Rhimes, uh, Anna Delvey, I think it's called Inventing Anna on Netflix. Mm -hmm. The like, it's like a little mini series. Um, it's incredible. And like certain women, specifically women, saw through her and were like, okay, like, I'm not going to be, you know, they were like, all right, I'm distancing myself. Like I, something's weird about you. But like plenty of other people, she just like used mm -hmm. professionalism as a weapon and professionalism as we know it and fail within all the mm -hmm. time. And it's like, if you, cause like she, you can see it. Like she would show up in these like super fashionable, like of the moment outfits and banks wouldn't take her seriously. And then she started showing up in like all black and like turtlenecks. Uh -huh. Yeah. And like her, her shoes weren't as wild. Like, right. Like it was a little more, it was closer to like Lizzie where it was like, you know, the like turtleneck and the black pants and the like jacket. Mm -hmm. Um, but still a little more fashionable because she wanted to create like an artist um, collective kind of thing. Like it was, it's still a thing where I'm like, I don't fully understand what she wanted mm -hmm. to create, but it sounded like a, an, an art gallery with co-working space. <laughs> hmm. But, and I was also like, that sounds honestly really fucking cool. And you know, like go off queen. Well, and, and you bring, bringing up, uh, and now I'm forgetting, Elizabeth, what is it, Elizabeth Holmes? Is that her full yeah. name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Theranos. Uh, thinking, yeah, the Theranos gal. Uh, thinking about, like, the fact that she also used, like, masculine traits in order to gain authority. And she just, like, played into, like, like yeah. these, like, subtle cues of authority that people just <laughs> respond to, which I think is very yeah. interesting. And yeah, like I, I don't know if I... I can't remember if I told you my theory of, about eccentric authority. Have I talked to you about this? No, I'm dying. I'm ready. So it's, bas it's basically like, hello. Um, so I, you know, I go to conferences. I go to networking events. Sometimes I go to, you know, like places that are like invite only for professionals and stuff like that. And when I show up in spaces like that with a bunch of other people in suits, you assume I know things because people who look like me don't normally go to those events. Yeah. And so I, I've noticed like sometimes when people are like, like the keynote speaker will have like a crazy haircut or something like that at these things. And so it's like making a really bold visual choice. People just assume that you, you're like ahead of the game or something, mm -hmm. which I think is, it's an interesting thing that I've always played with. Um, and I, I've just sort of leaned into over the years. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope that that continues because I'd like people to just, I mean, I think Gen Z is just going to implode everything. They love chaos. They love messy. They love, you know, clown core, you know, whatever. Um, so I, I'm very interested to see, especially with the gig economy on the rise, like, mm -hmm. I think, I think the suits and in-person work thing is probably very much on its way out. I mean, and it should be like, I mm -hmm. am so much more productive in my apartment, you know, like last week on Friday, I like went down to, I live right above the either or cafe on Williams mm -hmm. <laughs> and just like. Well, yeah, it's, like, very cute and gay. I just, like, went downstairs with all the queers and, like, worked for a few hours. And I got so much shit done, right? And mm -hmm. I just, like, didn't really do anything different. I was just there. And, and like, on some days, I get the most shit done just sitting here in my underwear. Like, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I'll throw on a, a sweater like this for, for a meeting where it's, like, you can't tell. I only have underwear on below this. But, like... <laughs> 
It's literally like we all make jokes about the no pants thing and stuff, but like it really is real. And some people are just more comfortable like that. Mm -hmm. And one thing I see a lot um, with TikToks, right, is like you'll see people being like the work from home. And then it's like, can everyone turn their cameras on? And people have like snacks and a pet and like just all the shit, you know, and they're just kind of like sitting there in loungewear. And I'm like, why hide that? Like, mm -hmm. like I get, you know, I do get some, like some of it. I'm like, okay, maybe not the cat like here. And like, you know, you're mm -hmm. leaning back eating like a bag of bugles or whatever. But right. I don't even know when I said that. I haven't <laughs> eaten bugles since I was like a child, but I feel like I really <laughs> aged myself there. If no one did the math from before. <laughs> like, I think we, yeah, we, we've all put them on our fingers, hopefully. <laughs> I really hope so. And I hope that if you, those of you listening that haven't, please do. It's quite delightful. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's what started my like femme troll, like witch obsession. Ooh. But um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing too, is like, I will be on camera, like fully shuffling my like tarot deck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes. And I'll just be like, y'all, mm -hmm. I just pulled this card, like in a team meeting. Mm hmm. I fucking roll up in my eye patch masks mm -hmm. and like, I don't know, say something about it. Like, I dare you because I'm here, I'm present, I'm doing the thing mm -hmm. and I'm also and you're good at really your good care of myself. Yeah. And I'm good at my job. Right. And that's the thing that like, I think is really important for everybody to remember is like, you need to just be good at your job and like, you know, it's, it, it, well, I will say it's like not quite that simple, but being good at your job and being able to find ways to communicate with the people who are like, who have the say mm -hmm. over your job is like, what's really important. Honestly, right. like you have to figure out ways to communicate so that like when you are struggling, needing help, like any of that, right. Like when it gets tough for real reasons, you can say like, this is really hard for me. Um, and, mm -hmm. and honestly, to me, that is also professionalism is being able to tell somebody like, this is really tricky for me and I need someone's help. Like mm -hmm. I need assistance. Right. Um, and that's really what I strive to like get across in every single training mm -hmm. that I present, teach, like whatever it is, you'll get a little bit about astrology. You'll get a little bit about me as an Aquarius. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> just like fucking chaos agent like here but like i have never gotten more uh like public accolades trying to just like fit into this like bubble mm. that people wanted like the last company that i was fired from was like a little it was like a smaller more local at the time it was local um under 500 people and they were very like, you know, bring your personality to work. And I did. And it like, wasn't, that wasn't yeah. what they meant. Right. This place, that was my experience. Yeah. And like, this place is very like, you know, bring your personality to work, but also like, and it's mm -hmm. very like in the thing is like, go ahead and bring your personality, but also like be professional, but like kind of saying fuck you to that a little bit and bringing mm -hmm. like the actual me to it. I like, I'm consistently amazed at just mm. how uh, well it has worked out for me. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, and I hope that that continues, you know, for like across the board for people. And same. Yeah. Like, when you brought up, when you brought up communication with like people above you, I think something that has always been challenging for me working with other people, um, the concept of tact is really challenging for me as a person like on the autism spectrum, because yeah. I'm doing my best to communicate accurately and mm -hmm. empathetically but people still find i and you know everybody's different but some people still get offended by like me asking for an accommodation or like me trying to advocate for like myself or people like myself yeah and i have never understood tact like i just don't get it it's i do think that one is kind of tricky and mm -hmm. again i think that like my, I don't know if it's like point of privilege or like luck specifically with this job. Um, but also I will say this, take time and reach out to people in your circle. Don't do it at work. I mean, you mm. can. Um, and also I will say this, mention your, dis mention your disability, your need, mention it publicly and fucking document it. Because if they try mm -hmm. anything with you, you now have it documented that like that is a potential for a lawsuit. Like fucking do it. 
because I am so outwardly queer. I say it in every training. Mm -hmm. I say it like when I argue with the person who is above me that I just, we do not communicate well. And thankfully she is not my boss, <laughs> mm -hmm. but like, but she does have an, a bit of, uh, she is at the top of like my team. So I will have to interact mm -hmm. with her, but I make sure that she is very aware. Like this is because I have ADHD or this is because like I am this way. Like I am chronically ill. So like this is a thing because then mm -hmm. when it comes time to use that against me, she fucking can't. Mm -hmm. um, so while it's like, don't tell your job that you have this need or that need, like, I don't know, sometimes it's worth it to do it because mm -hmm. then when they pull some bullshit, you can actually go and like do something about it. And you can even say like, is this because I have ADHD and it's very hard to deal with me? Or is it because I have autism mm -hmm. and it's very hard to deal with me? Cause I've never seen anyone backpedal faster than when I have pulled that shit out of my hat and they never expect it. <laughs> I wish, you know? I wish that I had, all I did was cry, you know, I mean, um, to like... be fair when I was in trouble and like on the path to getting fired at my last job, I did not do that. I learned the hard way to do that. And that was that I just like signed the NDA and was like, fine, I won't sue you. Although I have had plenty mm -hmm. of people be like, I don't even care how long ago that was. You should try. And I'm mm -hmm. like, that's what people have said to me too. I think about it very seriously. So like, I don't know, we should talk later about it. <laughs> but, like, yeah. but at the same time, like find people in your circle that know about um, that know how to interpret like HR documents for you. Mm -hmm. Find people that can help you navigate some of this stuff because the more that you know, the more screwed your company is. And that doesn't mm. mean that you have to stay there or anything, but we all know that we all need jobs in this world, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. we just cannot quit. So like knowing how to navigate this stuff so that you can at least stay there long enough to figure out what to do next is what's really important. Mm -hmm. And like, and also like there are ways that you can use that to your advantage in interviews. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to say what was going on, but you can say mm -hmm. like one thing I pride myself in is understanding the inner workings of any organization that I go to, because I take the time mm. to read things. Like I've had to navigate certain documents for like my role. You can just like, you know what I mean? Like there are so many ways to just like pull out this shit and like mm -hmm. not say what it was about. And they can't ask. Right. I mean, they could, but then if you answer correctly, then they know they're fucked with mm -hmm. the interview because then you've revealed something about yourself, you know, that like, they don't want you to reveal in an interview. Right. Um, so like learning how to, I, I like, no, I'm going to say learning how to weaponize it against them is really satisfying. Mm -hmm. That's um, interesting. So yeah, that's what I will say. And mm -hmm. again, it's not going to work for everybody, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like there are certain things, but like, you know, listen, if you're listening to this and you know me, come ask me, I'll fucking help you as best I can. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, find the white person in your world that can do it for you. Um, and just always remember like cis white men, men in general, I think men in general just burn bridges all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and that rage that like you talked about, like, I am shocked. I haven't said it yet on this podcast, but like, I love anger. Anger is my favorite thing in the world. It is so useful. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to harness it is really great. Um, and that's sort of what I've been trying to do with my like movement business is like really think about the anger of it all because like that's actually where I am. Like, like a, an expert, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I fucking love anger. It's so great. And so um, harness that shit and remember that these men coming before us have not understood how to harness it. And there are plenty of queers, women, folks of color, like of every spectrum, like of every point on the gender spectrum, right. That have like figured out how to harness their gender and done really well. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like you mentioned, like there's no one that's come before us like this. Mm -hmm. And I think I tried to think about like, you know, women that have come before. Like I, I honestly, I thought a lot about my mom for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. but she is fucking exhausted and she is kind of terrible. <laughs> like, you know, like we don't have the greatest relationship and it's because of how she is. And I think work did like, there's a lot of things, but I think work also did that to her. Mm. 
And I want to do what I can so that either I create a little bit of a path or what I say in a training or in an e-learning that someone is reading. Like if one manager leaves with like one bit of like, oh, harmony, <laughs> like an inclusive team doesn't just mean I have like, I check these boxes. It means that like, People understand how to fight together. They understand how to communicate. You know, like they understand how to get through all of these, like the spectrum of emotions. Mm -hmm. Like I've done, I feel like I've done everything that I can. Right, if you've had that that impact on that group. Yeah, if you're so big. Yeah, it, it makes me think about part of, part of why I get excited about what I do <clears throat> is I get excited about helping like non-traditional entrepreneurs be successful so that they can be bosses so they can start companies so they can you know hire more people like i i'm hopeful that like just i always say like just we're just gonna make everyone who has ever oppressed us irrelevant it's like yes. that's my hope um it's like anybody who has been rude to me or dismissed me or like whatever you know laid me off um who cares you know i'm just gonna go do something way more interesting that other people want to be a part of um, and I don't have to try to please my way into being accepted by those people. I'm just going to empower other people to create new spaces where we don't have to fight to exist. And I think like, it, yeah, I, you know, hearing about like how to communicate internally with, with like, I think I just am not, I'm not good at that. So I think yeah. that's why I have to be an entrepreneur It's like, I just, I don't, it doesn't come naturally to me. And even when I try my best, I still feel like a failure. And totally. I feel like no matter what they, like any corporate position I've ever been in, they don't want me to use my full range of talents, which I find extremely frustrating. Like they want me to do one task and yeah. I'm like, but I can really like bridge some things between these two departments in a way that's extremely helpful to you. And they're like, mm, yeah. yes. But when I work for myself, you know, I can find the people who are interested in that, which I like. Um, yeah. But it, it, I think that's the other part about working for myself that's nice is like, I get to choose who I work with and I won't work with people who won't hire someone with a neck tattoo or something like that, you know, versus, you know, when I was, I think you were there when I was deliberating about the neck tattoo and I was yeah, like, I was like, fucking do it. Who cares? Yeah. I mean, it's been great. Uh, and it like actually really attracts the kind of people that I want to work with, yeah. like tattoo artists and performers and so many sex positive professionals come to me for like websites and social media. I've been writing blog articles about how to post sex positive content without like getting deplatformed and like, it just makes me really, really happy to serve that community and to be included in that community that also yeah. truly does not give a fuck about, <laughs> about like corporate, you know, starched standards, which I, I think is lovely. Um, so uh, there was a question I wanted to ask you earlier, uh, especially as it relates to like the anger and even like the chronic, you know, illness and stuff like that. Yeah. What's the thing that people misunderstand about you the most? Ooh. Um. I mean, I think this goes blanket like my entire life. But the thing that people misunderstand about me the most is that I, um, I am not nice, but I am kind. Um, mm. Like I am the person that like one of my biggest, like I don't even want to say flaws, but like my biggest trigger with somebody and th that will create like friction in any relationship is like if I am misunderstood as like I say one thing and then that means that I suddenly don't care or like have, you know, like have an issue with this person thing, whatever. And it's like, no, no, no. Like I have an issue with this element of it, but I still really love and care about this. And like for you to, for anyone to suggest that like, this means that I just blanket don't care is really fucked up. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's like hard to verbalize it a little bit, I think, but it really is that like I, when I care very deeply and that gets negated by something tiny, it like, it does not sit well with me, mm -hmm. um, you know, because like we are whole people with a range of emotions and thoughts and feelings and like reactions. Right. So like one element of something does not mean that the rest of like everything that I feel about, like I said, like a person or a thing or an event, whatever mm -hmm. is now just like shit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think like that's definitely the thing that I feel most misunderstood all of the time because like, mm -hmm. you know, I think about, this person I work with that, um, not often, but that we just have a lot of trouble communicating and I think not so great things about her, but like, I am still kind to her. I do consider how she feels and how I need to try and like calibrate 
what I say so that like, A, I'm not seen as a problem because again, like I do want to be employed. <laughs> like I like what I do. Um, I enjoy where I'm at. I have a great, you know, um, I have a great gig and I don't want to fuck that up <laughs> completely. But I do also want it to be very clear that like what is happening is not okay. Mm -hmm. So that like that getting confused with me, just being blanketly like unkind would never mm -hmm. sit very well with me. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense that yeah. like people might take one incident and sort of like try to use it to characterize a whole bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. that, makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple other questions for you. I'm just putting okay. them up here. Uh, I'm curious in specifically what you do, Mm -hmm. What do you think is the most pers important personality trait or strength uh, for someone to be successful in your field? Mm. Like what, what aspect of, you know, I, I often talk about how you can be anti-professional, but you can still have high integrity and like yeah. be punctual and stuff like that. So what do you, what do you think is actually important for success as a trait? Mm, I truthfully, there's a, there's like two that really like, I think jump out. Um, one is communication, especially like if we think about this, um, I mean, both roles that I have, like I am a learning and development, like professional, like that's my gig. And that I think is even what, what like my movement coaching falls into. Um, and even like as a, as a dancer, like as a choreographer, right? Like as an artist that like communication is very critical. Um, and it doesn't just have to be in words. It's your body language. It's your face. Like virtually your face means a lot. Um, that mm -hmm. is very tricky for me because my face will tell you a whole book before my words can sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, so, yeah, so communication for me is really clear it was really critical. And I think that um, me, one of the things that I am working on the most currently is like in writing. Um, it's not my strong suit. I don't enjoy it. So I don't work on it very often. Um, and I do also have a person that the one that hired me at this company, like who is not my boss anymore, was like, you can find someone that'll do that for you. And I just like mm. love that about her because she's like, I feel like she just gets it, right? Like she's like, okay. Like, sure, go ahead and work on it, but like, why waste your time? Mm. It, like that, and that, yeah, like that to me is just like really fucking cool. And she's like a director of a whole department. Like she, I'm like, fuck yeah. And mm -hmm. she feels the same way about herself. Like it's not like she's just saying that. You know, like she really is like, I've done that. Like, go, like, who cares? Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. But so, so I would say like, find, you know, find a line of communication that you are best at, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm that person that if emailing is getting confusing, I'm going to say, you know what, do you have time for like a quick chat? Because I'm much better face to face and I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a little bit like we're missing each other's points. Mm -hmm. um, right. Cause there's so I, much, so much nuance that you can lose in writing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and for me specifically. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think is most critical is find creativity, whatever mm -hmm. that means for you. Um, like I used to say that artistry was what I always brought to every element of my work. And I feel like I bring that here in like the most buttoned up, boring. Like, I mean, I'm in fintech, like how boring, <laughs> how fucking boring. Um, and, and very buttoned up. Like, this is a thing where I tried to put, like, a gif of, like, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec one time. And my coworkers were like, mm, like, that's not going to fly. We need to figure out something different. And I was like, uh -huh. damn it. Okay. But I found something that was, like, just for me. It felt just as on point. It was, like, still funny. You know, it was still good. It worked, whatever. Um, but that's, that's the thing is, like, finding those moments of creativity um, and finding those moments where I can pop a, you know, an Erica Hart image, um, or like Jacob Tobiah or a like they are all over oh, yeah. my trainings and like people don't catch it because they don't know of these people. And that to me mm. is a little bit of a bummer, but also I'm like, you get to see these images that like, I don't find in stock imaging. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you get to see these versions of people that like really do exist and deserve to be in this world um, mm -hmm. and at this company and they are at this company. And so like, I am just finding visual representations of people that exist. Um, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, bring artistry to mm -hmm. anything that you do. And, and like, you can say, I don't have a creative bone in my body and that's just like not true. It just means bringing like something that feels authentic to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, like particular, uh, like flavor or lens you can lend to it. Cause I think we all have there lived is, experience yeah. that is relevant, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, I do think it's interesting that a lot of people don't identify as creative, but there's so much that we do every day, like even cooking, even getting dressed, even, you know, what we do at work that is, right. you are making things. Yeah. And you're, I just, it, ma it makes me sad to think of people who, who don't feel confident making a choice that's outside the box though. Cause I do often mm -hmm. refer to something as like the prescribed life. Like there is sort of like a script you can follow if you don't want to make any decisions. Right. And I hope, I hope, that when people interact with me, they realize that the script is completely made up and you can, you know, white out parts of it that you want to, you can, you know, draw a dog on top of it. Like you can turn it into a yeah. plane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... honestly, everyone should read A Little Prince and specifically mm. like the very beginning of it. Have you read it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Like specifically the beginning where they talk about like the drawing the elephant and they draw like an mm -hmm. elephant inside of a hat. It's just like a big lump. You right. know, like, and it's like the idea of the elephant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I think about that a lot where it's like, like, cause I'm again, like drawing, not a strong suit at all. Like, and I get frustrated with it. I don't like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I'm like drawing would be fun, but like, I don't know. I'm just not interested in learning how to do better because I'm mm -hmm. too old and too tired to per like, to be like basic element. Like, no, no, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. but I, but like, given this idea of like, draw something, like I'm going to have fun with it. I'm going to draw mm -hmm. my fucking little stick figure and like mm -hmm. put a bunch of detail in it. That's going to look wild and I'm going to have a good time. Right. Like, yeah. That is, that's what it and is. Play, to me. And playing like, with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Play is very yeah. crucial. Play is so, really okay, important. So, and I think, yeah, I think play is also important for innovation. Like being yeah. willing to like juggle around and like goof with something is like usually where you actually learn. Like even if you were like a, a chemical engineer or something, like yeah. maybe you're doodling, you know, like chemical bonds and then you're like, oh, wait a minute, you know, like just being able to to explore for the mm -hmm. sake of exploring, I think is where a lot of the really juicy stuff is. And I think yeah. like 90% of what I do with my online marketing is just experimental because I learn things that I can then tell to my clients like, oh, hey, I tried like 50 hashtags versus zero hashtags, or I tried, I tried this or that. And I get to learn things that no one else knows because I'm the, the only one that I'm aware of that's experimenting that way. Yeah. Yeah. And you're very like open about it too. Like, I feel like that's what I see of yours the most is when you're like, I tried this thing the other day and it like did really well. So I'm going to try it again. Like maybe it was mm -hmm. a flu. Like that's so fun. And like, why not try that? Because again, marketing is just all made up. It's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like, right. it's such trash. <laughs> well, and if you are trying to be like polished and professional and, and all, or, you know, however you want to define it. Yeah. I mean, you need pattern interrupt to get any attention these days. And yes. if you look like everyone else and you say what everyone else is saying, nobody cares. We've all heard it 30 times today already. Like you have to mm -hmm. say something interesting, even, yeah. even if you dare to be incorrect. Like, uh, I, I'm curious what you think about this. I've been, you and I might've talked about hate farmers. Um, like oh. Milo Yiannopoulos, Martin Shkreli, like these guys who deliberately like get hate engagement. And yeah. uh, I just think they're so fascinating. Like a part of me wishes I could do a performance art piece where I could be a hate farmer, but like, I, I don't think I have the, the emotional fortitude to do it, but it's just such an interesting concept. Oh my God. Honestly, so much of me is like, Chuck, let's figure that out. But I'm also like, do I have the emotional capacity for that? I don't know. Maybe not this year, but maybe in like five years. Sure, let's let's circle back. We'll circle back. Our, our five year plan is to become hate farmers. I love it. Okay, sure. so that reminds me. So this is this is my my final question for you, yeah. and uh, brings up something that you noted when I uh, when you filled out the form. Uh, what are you working on? What are you excited about? What do you want people to know about that you are you know creating in this world? Uh, so as an artist, I'm working on a piece about grieving. And um, sort of the process of like, it's turning into this, uh, what does the process of grieving look like? Um, I'm sort of thinking about it and I'm trying to think about it through like a collective processing lens. Um, but 
yeah, it's it's a little it's getting a little fun um, and exciting considering the residency I was just on. I can't remember if we were recording or not when I said it, but like uh, it had started with this idea of just like what does grieving look like? And I even thought of these like vignettes of like the different kinds of grief, right? Like we think about mm. death, but it's more than that. It's like grieving jobs, it's grieving friends, lovers, like all of that. Um, and now it's kind of become grieving as this environmental process. Um, mm. And I specifically think about like erosion, um, which is again, not where it started. <laughs> it started mm -hmm. with vultures because I love vultures and I think they're amazing. <laughs> they're so fun and cute. Uh, and so misunderstood in this world, mm -hmm. but, uh, erosion is really important as well. Right. And, and then also this idea of what can we make from that erosion? Mm -hmm. Um, so then that'll also become this like greater, uh, sort of like series of pieces with somebody, mm -hmm. uh, that I've been collaborating with, um, and dating <laughs> of like, mm -hmm. uh, pieces that have eroded from this piece are then going to be put into like a sculpture mm -hmm. piece that'll happen separately. Yeah. Um, and then we'll see like what happens from there. But um, so that is some stuff that I'm working on. Um, and also uh, I'm working on getting my coaching Ooh. back to like a little um, to something, uh, but specifically focusing on anger and like processing it and getting comfortable, mostly getting comfortable with it in your um, through movement. Um, and that's been sort of its own little challenge because it's like, it's like I've mastered it a little bit already, I think to an extent where like sort of figuring out now how to teach that or like show that to others is a little bit tricky. Um, so we'll see when that, when that's like feeling good and like ready to go. But, um, yeah, I'm sort of hoping by the end of this like summer, maybe I'll have something, um, probably a group class. That's really where I like to focus my work is like, like I love group learning. I think that is one of the most effective ways mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. Especially for these big emotions. I imagine having like wit witnessing multiple versions of things like this is, is helpful to see. Mm -hmm. Uh, it makes me think about, um, ecstatic dance and how I found ecstatic dance was really helpful for helping me process anger. Um, yeah. And I think I, in your poem, like the, the body's voice, like letting your body say what it wants to say and getting out mm -hmm. of its way is like such a, such a powerful pro like process um, that I yeah. think a lot of people are, you know, they don't want to hear what their body has to say because they, there's a lot, there's a backlog of like work you have to do if you start listening to your body and you're probably got to change your whole life and stuff. Oh, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that like when I decided so um i know you know izzy and janine but they are the two people mm -hmm. that kind of inspired me to do to like shift it from like joy in the body to like anger because they were like you uh -huh. are the one that taught me i should like give my anger a hug like watching mm -hmm. you is like and i was like oh my god okay um mm -hmm. but like thinking about that i was like but also i feel like i need to really like have people that i work with like also be in therapy because like I'm not a therapist and I certainly don't want to play that role at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's like a really dangerous game and like not okay. Um, so that is like its own little challenge as well. It's like, mm -hmm. where is that? Where do I feel that line is for me? And like, how do I really encourage and like um, adhere to that um, mm -hmm. with an accessibility like lens too, right? Because like therapy's fucking expensive and mm -hmm. um you know not everybody can handle it but i think it would be mm -hmm. sort of like a what is you know have you been in therapy recently like are you planning to be you know i like it's one of those or do you things have like, a support structure kind of thing yeah like what's your support mm -hmm. structure because this is not therapy and it's interesting because i i remember when i first started coaching like finding that line between you know people are like what's the difference between coaching and therapy and it's like well you know a therapist is like there to do like deep trauma work with you almost on like a medical level and i'm here to like hold you accountable and i always say like as a coach i feel like so much of what i do is just giving people permission mm -hmm. to, do the, to do the thing they wanted to do anyway um yeah. but there's something about those containers like when i'm coached it's the same thing like i wouldn't have taken the time to go down that road or, or you know process that thing but that person kind of forcing me to be present um yeah. is, is always helpful mm -hmm. yeah well, so it's yeah. it's that but anyway that's what i'm going to be working on so yeah very cool for that um and my dance stuff 
I'm working on putting a lot of the content that I got from Playa into like a big video to put on my Patreon. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's a place. Yeah, what's you can the what's the best way for people to find you after this if they want to know more about you? Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. Is it Honeymoon? I don't remember what the hell my Instagram handle is. Let's find out. <laughs> let's yeah, let's find out. I don't remember. I, when <laughs> you I do find out. This, no, it's fine. If I was any good at this, I'd like no right. But it's cool. Oh, I see Honey LaFleur PDX. There it is. Correct? Yeah. Okay. That will yeah, be in the show you, notes. Yeah. And if you search Honey Marie on Instagram, you'll find me too. Um, Perfect. But yeah, Honey LaFleur PDX. That's really the place to go. And my Patreon is linked there. Um, and it's uh, it's updated semi-irregularly, um, mm-hmm. but a little bit more now recently that I am working a little bit harder um, and with a goal of performance, hopefully. Um, in summer. Well, that's exciting. Uh, Okay. And then um, as a close, do you have any closing thoughts or, or things in your brain bucket that you feel like you want to say in this space about anti-professionalism or anything that wants to come out of you? Yeah. I mean, I can't stress enough, like how to support person, people, whatever, or like figure out your company's like HR shit, like know that, um, and know how to use it. Um, don't be afraid to share little tidbits about your identity so that then they are on the hook. Um, you know, you'll figure out a balance that feels comfortable for you, but like, I definitely recommend thinking about that. Um, and then also don't be afraid to say the thing and be the voice of dissent. Um, you know, understand that there are always going to be consequences to what we say, right? Like we talk about it all the time with fucking like douchebags that are trying to ruin queer people and trans people and people of color's lives. Um, there are, there are, you can say whatever you want, but there are consequences. So like mm-hmm. know what those consequences that your company are going to be. And if you work at a smaller company, odds are HR is bullshit. So mm-hmm. do you know that? <laughs> you know what I mean? But also sometimes if they don't have a good HR, that means you can get them in, on, in trouble for way more. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Just, just putting it out there. I'm just like throwing that out there. Um, but yeah, I will say like, um, take take some time to like really think about just exactly how bold you want to be um, and how mm-hmm. comfortable you are being at a certain boldness like level, right? Like you can build up to it. Um, and as someone, like I said at the very beginning, who has said some fucked up shit before to people that like, I wish I could have done different, like it's never too late to start Mm -hmm. Um, and know how to do better. And like you, you um, there is a place there for you. Mm -hmm. You'll, you'll find it. And I can never guarantee that one company is going to be the better place for another, but um, I found mine in the corporate world for now. And it's, it continues to blow my mind. Oh, also one last thing. Mm. I'm sorry. This is a lot, but like meds, I can't stress meds enough if you have access to them. Um, Mm. I think a lot of this, I should have said earlier, but like I started Stratera. Um, You were part of that, (laughs) or like you knew about that. But I started Stratera as part of my ADHD um, diagnosis, like treatment. And it has been one of the biggest uh, like keys to unlocking my comfortability with who I am Mm. and speaking up. Um, and also calibrating some of my uh, boldness, mm-hmm. to yeah, put it mildly. I, I hear you on that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, meds if you need them. Like, mm-hmm. take your meds. Yeah, yeah explore it with, with a doc. Yeah, talk mm-hmm. to your doctor. <laughs> yes, talk to your doctors. But, like, meds. Meds are great. Um, Stratera is something that, like, hits your rejection anxiety, like, switch. Mm. And it was, it was key for me um, because a lot of my, like, childhood trauma just constantly feeling rejected. So, mm-hmm. which is, yeah, very common for those of us with ADHD. Yeah. Just kept trying yeah. to be a people pleaser and it never worked. And so it always like, Ooh, I almost knocked <laughs> shit over. Um, but it like, it just like would, you know, it would, I would react just completely wildly. Um, and Stratera has helped me figure out how to be like, I'm not going to do that. And here's why. Mm. So yeah, I love it. 
Well, thank yeah. you so much for your time, honey. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, share your links and I hope lots of people get a lot out of this conversation and feel inspired to go kick some ass. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close the episode. I'll say goodbye. Uh, see you next time. Well, thanks so much for listening to that episode. This is your host, Chuck Cope Inspire, uh, saying, get out there and do something wild today. Be stupid on purpose. Uh, don't listen to the haters. Uh, be nice to people if they're nice to you. And um, professionalism is made up, so make up your own definitions. Last but not least, don't forget to go to www.identitypending.com if you need some creative marketing strategy from someone weird like me. Have a great day.